You're listening to The Digital Deep Dive, where we tackle the newest trends, strategies, and pain points shaping growth across the digital landscape. From Amazon and D2C to international expansion, join our host and e-commerce leaders across multiple industries for in-depth discussions on how to maximize your brands in the digital arena. Now, here's your host, Aaron Conant. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Digital Deep Dive podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Conant. And today, we wanted to dive into the topic of direct import with Amazon. As you know, uh, I talk to 20 or 30 brands a week, uh, helping out with digital strategy. And uh, when the same topics come up over and over again, we like to pull them into the podcast as a whole. And so uh, direct import, I think this topic is directly related to the fact that a lot of people are trying to optimize uh, profitability and pricing strategy with Amazon as a whole. And uh, what's really interesting is, although it's a s- simple couple words, direct import, it seems very complex to set up correctly. And so I have a lot of people interested in it. They just don't know all the different levers to pull. And so we've got some great friends, uh, supporters of a ton of brands in the network over at the Honkers Club. And uh, you know, it recently did a webinar with, with Hannah and it was so good. I thought, hey, we need to bring her in and uh, have her on for this episode of the podcast. So Hannah, if you want to jump in, a brief intro on yourself and the Hawkers Club would be great. And then we can kind of jump into all this conversation around direct import as a whole. Sound good? Yeah, sure. Um, So thanks for having me on the podcast today. Um, I'm Hannah Blackburn. Um, I'm one of the directors at the Hawkers Club. Uh, We were founded nearly six years ago now by two Amazonians. My background is in cost saving um, from the Amazon side. So uh, it feels kind of strange to be on the other side now, trying to save costs for vendors instead of for Amazon. Um, and then also in in-stock management. Um, so trying to make sure that supply chains are optimized um, and that products remain uh, as available as possible to the customer, but are still making a profit. Um, since then, we have uh, moved to the US because I was previously based in London. Um, and now we're a Chicago-based agency helping brands from everything to direct import to AMS, to, um, again, how to optimize their supply chain. Um, and yeah, as you said, this year has been the year of direct imports. It's been quite exciting for an in-stock nerd like me. <laughs> I love it. So let's just start off with uh, you know some high-level things. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of companies are asking, like, am I right for direct import? So you know, to kind of like break it down, like, who would be the right fit for direct import? So uh, the right fit for direct import um, is actually widened uh, over the previous couple of years. It used to be if you had supply chain in China um, and if you could ship full containers. Um, And then it really widened out when Amazon started doing milk rounds and let you ship partial containers. So it meant that a lot of smaller brands could get involved. And then it also widened out as Amazon opens up the locations. So Amazon used to do it primarily from China. Now they um, do will do direct import from Israel, Mexico, Vietnam. Um, so, and then the last part that's kind of means if you're right for Amazon as a direct import vendor is they give you an option in Vendor Central um, called the Direct Import Self Service Tool. Um, and pretty much if you have that, um, it means that Amazon believe in your product and they believe that you are one of the right vendors. So, to be honest, if you have a Vendor Central account that you're focusing on and growing, all likelihood is you can start up, um, uploading ASINs to direct import if you wanted to. But, you know, what? how does the, the pricing, um, you know, the financial aspect, how does that evaluation look? How, do, how should brands take a look at it? Is it something that everybody should evaluate? Um, that's a really great question, actually. I think that it is something that everybody should evaluate. Um, so the reason that you will be able to know where Amazon thinks you are. So every price you submit to Amazon, they will give it a bronze, silver, or a gold rating. A bronze rating means, okay, or, or they'll totally reject it. So total rejection means they don't think you're ready, um, and they'll tell you what you need to do to get ready, such as we need to see a 30% drop in the price you've offered us, etc. cetera. Um, if it's bronze, they say, okay, you know, you're kind of ready, um, we will order 20% of the stock direct import. Silver, they'll say, you know, you're getting better. Um, and 60% of the stock will be direct import. And gold means that they will try to get between 80 to 90% of the stock direct import and they're happy with the price. 
So what we actually use a self-service tool with vendors to do in the beginning is to benchmark where they are. And a lot of the time, if you, for example, get a lot of bronzes out of the system, that is when you can look into your account and we'll find things like um, a high damage rate or um, excessive customer returns or other profitability drivers for a SKU um, that we'll have to work on before it's the right time to do direct import for you. And so, you know, when you're looking at it from a pricing standpoint, though, you know, a lot of people are concerned, you know, that that it's going to drastically impact the overs that, you know, Amazon is either paying you and or how much they're going to retail the product for. You know, what should brands be thinking about in, when it comes to pricing as a whole? Um, so I think that the two primary things they should be thinking about is one, to be very transparent, it does affect the amount Amazon pays you. Um, because of course it's a lower base um, that they're paying you because they're taking on a lot more of the import costs, et cetera. So in terms of cash flow, it's something that you need to plan carefully because for example, if you um, upload your entire catalog onto direct import and say it gets gold and Amazon start uh, requesting that, that pushes back your payment terms by at least 30 days. Um, it lowers the amount of cash you'll get, even though you'll have an improved margin. So it's something that you really want to stage and plan over time. Um, secondly, is the fact that um, you don't have to pay trading terms with direct import. So it's imagine whatever your trading terms are, and they're increasingly as standard over 20% is just completely um, taken out of the equation. And that's the, one of the biggest benefits of the program. Yeah. I mean, so you can lower, I mean, at the other day you can ro- lower retail prices without hurting your margin. Is that how people look at it? Yep, exactly. So you can lower retail prices, um, without hurting your margin. And then most of the time when we do direct import with vendors, we actually find that not only are you not hurting your margin, you can increase your margin. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. What is, how long does it take start to finish? Uh, and if we can break it into a few different segments, which is the first one, the evaluation and whether or not you should do it. The second one is actual implementation. And then the third one is before you start actually realizing, you know, an impact on margin as a whole. So the first stage um, where you find out if you can do it is, I would say a couple of weeks. Um, and that is where you would get your internal P&L together, you would understand what direct import you would want. And most importantly, you would compare that price to what you're currently offering Amazon for non-direct import. Because with direct import, you're asking Amazon to take a chance on a container or a lot more of your stock than what they'd usually get on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Um, So for that, Amazon are expecting a discount as well as the fact that they're taking on additional costs. So if you can offer direct import pricing that is very little difference to your um, normal weekly stocking pricing, it's unlikely that Amazon will be happy with that. And that's why you need to really truly look at your P&L and say, this is the sharpest price we can offer where we will still uh, have a great margin. Um, So that process takes about two weeks. After that, um, the middle section is pretty much how long is a piece of string in the sense that if you have a lot of bronze or rejected products, it will take longer to fix some of the underlying issues that cause the products to be that way. So maybe it's implementing a map policy. Maybe it's looking at packaging to reduce breakages. Maybe it's creating a how-to video so the customers return less product. Um, And all of those factors play into Amazon's margin. Um, And that's what, if you improve, you'll be able to even suggest the same cost again and get a different answer from Amazon. Usually we see that take around six months um, for products that need improvement. For products that don't need improvement, you'd skip right to stage three, which is where you've uploaded the um, pricing. After that, it depends on the time of the month that you've uploaded it. Amazon send out direct import orders on the 10th or 11th um, of every month. So if you upload it on the 8th, you will see orders very quickly. If you upload it on the 12th, you'll wait about a month. Um, And then after that, it's how long does it take for your stock to reach um, the US, which is when you can invoice. And I kind of see that as the end of the process. 
a successful DI invoice. Um, and although Amazon takes possession of it in China, uh, the invoicing process begins when the stock touches the SC. So that can be about three um, to four months afterwards. Awesome. Love it. Um, so the next thing that pops up routinely is going to be around, you know, planning as a whole. And, you know, that's already an issue with Amazon across the board, right? Every, nobody wants to go out of stock. Um, when you think about the direct import model, how are you advising people around how should they be thinking about forecasting as a whole, just so they don't run out of stock, there is a major gap or delay? We'd love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say there's three things. One primary thing to always point out with forecasting is Although Amazon acknowledge that um, Chinese public holidays, um, especially uh, Chinese New Year, are real, um, and other public holidays, wherever they direct import from, are real, they do not and will not factor them into when you receive POs. Um, so you can't go back to Amazon and say, oh, we need to push back our production dates because of Chinese New Year. Um, and that is why it's very important to have an open conversation with your factories when you're supplying your lead times to Amazon um, so that they're realistic. A lot of people will say um, to Amazon, I can do it in 60 days, thinking that once they get that direct import relationship set up, they can go back and have a second bite of the apple. Uh, but the way I say to always talk about lead times is to think about it like you're getting a tattoo whatever lead time you tell Amazon, you have to be comfortable to stick to that lead time forever for the life of that ASIN. Um, and that is because Amazon are incredibly rigid on lead times. So that's the most important thing in forecasting. Uh, the second in terms of the physical amount of units uh, that Amazon may order, again, they're going to be ordering about um, however often they order from you is however often they will be forecasting for. So if you're getting monthly DI orders, they will over time normalize where they're going to be ordering a month's worth of stock at a time. But if you get DI orders, for example, every three months, then likelihood is they'll be ordering larger amounts. Um, and then last but not least um, is the seasonality aspect of it. Um, and that is that Amazon will order far closer to the season than you usually would when you import. Um, and that's one thing that you have to, unfortunately, manage yourself if you're a seasonal vendor, um, because Amazon will order quite close to the season and sometimes it will come in and sometimes it won't. So when you receive the order, you need to look at it and figure out yourself, is it going to come in in time? Because if it doesn't come in in time, Amazon will then bring it in anyway because they ordered it they'll mark it down and then they'll be selling your stock in the wrong season. Um, so you have to make sure that when you're a seasonal vendor, at some point you actually stop accepting orders when you know that Amazon aren't going to make the deadlines. Awesome. I love it. As well as the, like the additional insight around when people are thinking, you know, how much is Amazon ordering? You can kind of just do the backlog of, hey, it's directly related to how often they're ordering. You know, what about, um, turning off direct import, you jump into it. Maybe it's, you know, an ASIN that you don't ever, you don't know, maybe you're not making anymore and maybe you don't want to do direct import with it anymore. We'd love to hear your thoughts on, is it possible to turn it off? Uh, do you just increase the cost? Like what's the best way to, number one, can you? And number two is what's the best way to turn it off if you can? Yeah. Um, so interestingly, uh, I always say to plan for turning DI off from the very moment you're even considering offering Amazon. It's one of those things where hope for the best, plan for the worst, almost like a prenum. Um, what we say is that you need to look at your pricing structure that you offer to Amazon, not on a vendor code by vendor code level, um, but in a holistic level of where can they get this product at this price. So if, for example, you make your direct import offer much, much incredibly cheaper than your um, normal primary offer to Amazon, which is the weekly stocking order. Um, it is much harder to then turn the tide and turn DI off, DI off because Amazon will get used to that new level of margin that they're getting and they will never want to go back from that. They will keep ordering even if you make the product um, permanently unavailable. 
Um, they won't really want to let it go. They'll say that your normal order is unprofitable, even if they didn't have a problem with it previously. Um, so what you want to do is you want to look at your dropship order as being your most expensive, your stocking order as being the standard, and then your DI order as being the cheapest. But you don't want a huge amount of variation between those. So we say that you want approximately 15 to 20 percent variation. So dropship, 15 to 20 percent more uh, cheaper if they stock it, 15 percent, 20 percent more if they're going to take the jump and order a DI amount. Um, and that's the best way to turn it off in the sense that if it's not hugely different margin wise for Amazon, um, but different enough to justify the additional stock, they will get the message when you start rejecting DIPOs and they will eventually switch back to your previous order. But if you offer them the best deal ever, they won't switch back and you can actually end up um, pretty much killing your ASIN on Amazon if you don't plan ahead. Awesome. Love it. Um, is there new things popping up in direct import? Because I know there's also a lot of brands that have been there for a while. Are there things they should be thinking about, optimizations? Um, would love to hear if there's anything new in the space that you see popping up. Yeah. Um, so actually, two new and exciting things are popping up. Um, one is that Amazon is on the verge of making direct import entirely self-service. Right now, you can put in direct import pricing if you have direct import vendor codes, which you still need to get from a vendor manager. And I know everyone hears the words vendor manager and groans. Either I don't get one or mine's disappeared and I don't even know if they still work there. Um, by the end of this year, we're expecting Amazon to have made it where you can raise your own vendor codes with a DI ticket um, and that, and then slowly roll that out across the whole vendor community. That will mean that you have the freedom to join direct import faster, roll new products into direct import where it used to only really be for more mature products. And pretty much your fate is in your own control with direct import, which it hasn't ever previously been. Um, so that's one very exciting. And then the second, which is the most exciting, is that Amazon has started to look at direct import with a global lens. So rather than saying, this is the product we need for one location, and then having a totally different setup in another location, um, they've started to think, okay, how much do we need for the world? Um, so that means it'll simplify the process for vendors that can supply the same SKU to the entire world. If you have a plug, for example, it's a little bit harder but anyone that doesn't have a plug and it's the same unit everywhere around the world. Um, but it also brings in its own uh, things that you need to be aware of in the sense that we're doing a lot of uh, manual translation right now in terms of user manuals, et cetera, because instead of this is our units that are going to France, this is our units that are going to the US, it's these are the units, Amazon will put them where they want. So we need to make sure that whatever customer gets this, it's fit for purpose. That's crazy. I mean, the thing that it, I mean, it makes sense. It's the, the natural evolution, but we're here, right? I think COVID has accelerated so many things. That it's, it's kind of exciting. I think Amazon's looking at it holistically because in the past, they've been so segmented. Uh, you know, another especially question- Especially new markets. Um, oh, sorry, just the, the only addition to that is, especially new markets where it doesn't, for example, make sense for a lot of smaller vendors um, to, to try going to Australia, to try going to India, Japan. Um, but with this, uh, they kind of get to try that with Amazon support. That's awesome, right? And it's a little bit different than, you know, I don't know what it was three years ago or so where Amazon just, you know, you could just hit the button and you would, it would start cross-border sales of your products, which wasn't always good when they started doing that, <laughs> especially if there were regional trade agreements in place um, and exclusivity. <laughs> I think a lot of brands ran into that with like, uh, you know, their Australia divisions and stuff like that. But what are, the, are there any downsides? Are there any pitfalls that people should be aware of? Or you see, you know, stumbling blocks? Uh, and maybe there's issues that you routinely help clean up for brands when it comes to direct import. Um, I would say that uh, you kind of really have to get rid of the old mindset of, okay, I've sold this stock to Amazon. I wash my hands of it. It's now Amazon's responsibility. And you need to focus a lot more on what is happening to the stock even after Amazon has bought it. Um, because direct import means it's, it's a bigger program. It means that you can sell more volume, but it also means that any mistakes that you make are bigger. 
And the two ways that we see this is that if you do not manage Amazon sell through and make sure that they aren't stuck um, or overstocked with your direct import goods, um, that means that they will start selling it off. Um, and then all of a sudden your direct import offer becomes unprofitable to Amazon and they'll stop sending POs or they'll start asking you for additional funding. Um, so that's something that you have to manage more intensely with DI because it's a lot easier to sell through two weeks of stock that Amazon um, becomes overstocked with than it is with three months uh, that they might buy, buy on DI. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second is any charges. So because a lot of Amazon's charges um, or chargebacks are based on a price per unit, if you make a mistake on an order that's a weekly order, yeah, you might get charged, say, $2 a unit times 10. Whereas if you're shipping in a thousand direct import and there's that same mistake, maybe you forgot to register your PSYOP certificate or you didn't label correctly, then it's $2 times a thousand. Um, and in that way, you can make mistakes a lot faster. Um, and we've seen a lot of vendors that happened to them with the first few months after they launched direct import, things that were so small on the PL on a week to week basis that just kind of got swept under the rug and thought, oh, that's a cost of doing business. As soon as it's DI and those charges come in large chunks, it's a surprise and you've got your CFO shouting saying what's happening. So that's something to definitely think about before you launch the program. Yeah, do you ever have uh brands run into issues where we'll say it's a bronze, uh, but Amazon starts ordering a ton of it and it almost shorts other retailers as a whole. Are you able to adjust orders as they come in? That is actually a fantastic question. I'm very glad it came up because um, Amazon have a specific chargeback to get rid of that. So um, to get rid of that situation. So if you uh, reject more than 20% of the PO, they do start fining you 10% of the rejected amount. And again, with DI, that can become quite considerable. So it's very important that whoever is managing your stock, yes, is doing it from the business perspective, but knows all of the rules of managing your different channels. So sometimes... Unfortunately, it is better to reject an entire DIPO if you are only going to be able to fulfill, say, 40, reject the whole PO to avoid that charge. Um, so you pretty much have to know from the beginning which uh, vendors are you happy, or sorry, which like marketplaces um, are you happy to let lose out? Um, because when you try and keep them all happy, that's when Amazon starts charging you and you regret doing direct import with them. Whereas if you say from the beginning, okay, we are going to wait for stock to normalize. And until then, we might turn off X, Y, Z other channels. Um, you're going to be a lot more successful than, than trying to maintain the status quo during the transition period. Awesome. No, it's, uh, it's crazy. Like, how complicated is it? Like, in all reality, if a normal brand, like, I know you engage your, your experts here, right? So you come in and help a lot of brands figure all this out. Uh, how many brands are doing it, would you say, percentage-wise successful? And should they, they do it or should they engage with somebody? Is it something that's fairly easy? It's just it looks intimidating? Um, I actually think that it depends on the structure of your business um, and on the role of the person that is going to be primarily responsible for DI. Uh, there are brands doing it successful. Um, I believe that the most brands, to be honest, should get help, um, even if it's just a, like finding out the roadmap and getting their entire team bought in. Because the hardest part about DI for the business from an internal perspective is that it's a very cross-functional move. And a lot of the time you have a, an e-commerce manager or an e-commerce director is going to be the one that runs this program. And it makes sense because they do everything else with Amazon. But there's so much that can go wrong with DI in terms of if you price incorrectly, you're pretty much stuck with that price on that ASIN, on that vendor code. So you need to make sure that the, the P&L you decide to use to figure out the price that you need is correct, which means that you need true um, involvement from the financial team. 
you need to make sure that you avoid charges um, and compliance holdbacks, which is kind of your compliance team, your operations team. And then you need to make sure that your factories in China are bought in, which often is another team, again, your sourcing team. Um, so it depends on whether or not the company is strong um, doing cross-functional projects. If it's a very siloed company where the e-commerce team does everything e-commerce and then you've got your trade section, which is totally different, and then maybe your accounting team's a little bit removed, that's when you need the most help and that's when you're most likely to fall into some of the, the deeper pitfalls. Um, but if your company is very, very cross-functional um, and very collaborative, you will have an easier time of launching direct import. What are you, um, I don't know, most excited about over the next six to nine months? Oh, wow. Um, and, but before we get there, before we get there, actually, are there questions that came that that I didn't bring up today? Are there new things that you think, you know, that we should be aware of or there's key things that I didn't ask about because they haven't come up in, in regular conversations I'm having with brands? Yeah, sure. Um, so the most one that I think hasn't came up um, that doesn't come up simply because people don't know what they don't know um, is the seasonality of pricing on Amazon DI. Um, so Amazon DI look at your performance of your SKU um, in the trailing 12 months before you price, and they make all the decisions based on that data. So you need to look at what good and what bad happened in the previous 12 months. So say the two use cases here is say you're a Halloween vendor and you try and launch your pricing at Halloween or just after Halloween where you've sold through all your stock, you are going to get the best price you can get from Amazon in that moment because in that moment, you are selling really fast. The customer wants you. And Amazon will be making money on your products. That's the most likelihood. Whereas if you're a Halloween vendor and you, for example, start pricing in February, March, customers haven't looked at your detail pages in a while. Amazon might be stuck with a handful of units that they're dropping the price on. And that's the data that they'll be referring to thinking, oh, this is a bit more of a risk. And then that's when they'll offer you a lower price. So same product, same everything from your side. But from Amazon, it's a totally different um, ball game, And that's why you have to take seasonality into account. Um, and the second um, thing to do with when you upload it is map. So if you've had, for whatever reason, um, someone crash your price because maybe Hayneedle made a mistake and Amazon started matching them, if that goes on for about six weeks, you may want to wait. Um, and that happened, you know, 11 months ago, 10 months ago waiting that incremental two months before you load your price can make the hu a huge difference margin wise. And we've actually seen waiting until the right time to load your prices mean that you can get a 20 to 40% higher price than what you would have got had you done it just or oh, whenever the team's ready or whenever we get around to it on the to-do list. That is awesome. And I think you're right. Most people just, it doesn't even occur to them, that, you know, how many different little things and levers that need to be pulled because a lot of times people will try to tackle this on their own and it won't work mm -hmm. out right uh, i'll hear on both sides direct import is amazing i'm in the same category i'll hear it's horrible it doesn't work out at all um what are you the most excited about over the next you know six to nine months as a whole um so i think kind of the, the two things that came up is the self-service side and then the the global aspect of it um, what I do think is the most interesting, though, and what excites me the most, having the profitability background, is what we've seen this year with vendors that do choose to do direct import. When um, customers are squeezed on how much they can spend, and then a lot of brands have bought and are holding stock right now that they brought in on very high container prices, anyone that can do any action, which means that they improve their own margin to either lower the customer cost, or even right now, it's enough to just maintain your current prices without having to increase the price to the customer has seen a huge upside on Amazon, especially. Um, and that's something that's the most exciting thing about direct import. We have brands that would otherwise be struggling and they're, they're struggling on Wayfair, they're struggling on Walmart, and on Amazon, they're growing 30, 40% still um, because they've managed to maintain that price for the customer. Wow. 
Love it. Well, you know, it's been an awesome conversation today, Hannah, and thanks for uh, jumping on uh, and sharing all these insights. Again, everybody, if you like to reach out to Hannah, Hannah Blackburn at Hawkers Club, just a fantastic resource for a ton of brands in the network. Hannah, thanks again so much for your time today. And with that, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Digital Deep Dive. Uh, if you enjoyed it, uh, you know, I encourage you to like it, uh, subscribe to it, and just really enjoy being on this digital journey together. Everybody take care.